Hi, it's great to see everybody here. Um, I have to kind of stand near this mic, so I like to walk around, but I won't stray too much. Um, and it's great to see so many familiar faces. But more than anything, I just want to express my gratitude to all of you for your compassion, your commitment, and willingness to support refugees who are moving into our community. It makes me feel proud of being a resident here, um, so thank you. Uh, I just want to say that I appreciated the very generous introduction that Jenny gave me. Um, I really want to have a conversation with you and share some of my thinking that's come from having responded to a lot of major disasters, including armed conflict, and certainly that's involved many displaced people um, who have been refugees in their own countries as well as having to move to other countries. But I don't, I don't feel like I have all the answers. I don't feel like I'm um, the expert on this topic. So what I really want to do is share a model that I've been working on for about 15 years that I think is applicable to your work as members of Circles of Care. And that's what I was hoping to kind of cover tonight and see what you think about it, get your reactions, and certainly leave a lot of time for all of us to talk to one another. Um, and also, please feel free to interrupt me while we're, or interrupt me, ask questions while I'm, while I'm talking. I, I, I <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, I guess. This is a, a Freudian school of social work. So um, those things happen. Um, any questions or anything anybody wants to say before I get going here? All right. So I just thought it'd be helpful to start off with some questions for you, which is, what do you hope to achieve with the people you're working with? Um, how can you be supportive? And this is a really important one. How can you not, with good intentions, inadvertently undermine sources of strength and resilience that refugees are carrying with them individually and collectively? And I've seen this happen many times in my work, so I want us to think about that. So any responses to those first three questions? We'll just take them all together. What do you hope to achieve? How can you be supportive? How can you make sure you don't undermine what people already know? Any reactions to that? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good question. One of the things I want to look at is how much do you have to do directly or how much can you do by helping build support systems for peop with people who do speak the language, who do understand the culture, or how can you transcend that gap in a way that um, is egalitarian and empowering as opposed to hierarchical and trying to have people meet you as opposed to meeting them. So that's a really good point. Any other reactions? Yeah, Kathy. Um, there's just a space and welcome that that's not always. That's a really good point because we have a lot of people here and so far we don't have a lot of uh, <laughs> refugees who have arrived and so there's a lot of good intentions but we have to make sure that we don't overwhelm people, smother people um, and that we also, um, and I'm gonna get to this later, leave room for people's self-efficacy so that we don't, in our efforts to help, create dependency or act as if people can't do things on their own. Because again, everybody who's coming here has survived really um, challenging, arduous, life-threatening situations and probably could be teaching us a lot tonight. And so how do we validate and recognize that and at the same time be supportive and recognize that this is a really hard transition. Um, and how can we help people to manage that without undermining their power and autonomy? Yeah. Two things. I was wondering how we can practice some culturally competent perspective and not let our own Western modes of looking at people get in the way. Great. That's very much what I'm going to be delving into tonight. And also knowing that people are coming 
dealing with a lot of trauma, how to also have appropriate boundaries with them and um, not just see them as people who are have trauma and, and see them as people who are also resilient. Exactly. So it's really important to have a balance and to be able to be open to and aware of potential vulnerabilities, such as experiencing trauma, um, while at the same time not seeing people as trauma victims and seeing them as full people. And um, it's, it's, I want to get back to the trauma issue because I, I think we have to be also be careful that we don't assume people have trauma. Because actually, I've worked with lots of people who've experienced horrific things and they don't have trauma. Or if they've had trauma, they've worked it through, not by going to therapy, but through social and cultural practices or their own strength and resilience. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so I very much want to focus on that tonight. I'm glad you brought that up. Any Great, yeah. To give, give people the ability to set their boundaries with you and their limits with you. Great. Um, so. Um, I am um, assisting in the ESL class. And part of that involves um, just conversational, conversations. So what I'm hearing in that is, is how can you interact with people, form a relationship with them in a way that expresses curiosity and um, concern while at the same time not being invasive or imposing something that you don't want to impose on a person and gives them the agency to decide what they share, what they don't share, um, and to engage with you without feeling like they have to take care of you or be your teacher. Absolutely. Yeah, well, that's great. And that's certainly a goal. Also, when you talk about boundaries, how do we know if we're overstepping those boundaries that deal with their culture that we're unfamiliar with? Right. You know, if you don't know, you can offend somebody without realizing it. You can ask questions that are inappropriate that you really don't understand. Yeah, so, so I want to come back to that because I, I think what I'm hearing from a number of you and, and, and in your question is not wanting to hurt people, um, not wanting to transgress, but on the other hand, you don't want to be walking on eggshells. You don't want to be so tentative that you, you, that you can't engage with people. And I'm assuming many people, if not most people in this room, have traveled and have formed relationships with people um, in other countries, from other cultures, or in this country um, have relationships with people who have social and cultural backgrounds that are different than your own. So I think you have expertise in that, actually. Um, and it's not like this is suddenly this big new thing that you don't know how to manage, but it can feel like that. So I want to come back to that, um, which is how can you trust yourself, feel confident, while at the same time being respectful and not invasive? Should I move on? OK. And two. two Provisos. One is, uh, you heard about my work in northern Uganda. I only arrived back home from northern Uganda um, about less than 48 hours ago. 
So um, if I start drifting off or if I take a nap, <laughs> don't be afraid to throw anything or, or yell. And, and the second thing is I'm used to talking to like other social workers or clinicians who do this kind of work. So if I lapse into jargon, um, please challenge me or ask questions uh, if it doesn't make sense to you. Okay. Um, so I want to start off with this whole notion of self in society. When you're helping people recover from an armed conflict, and everybody who's coming here as a refugee has been in a situation where there's been armed conflict, as far as I know, um, there's two things that we need to understand. We need to understand a person's self and personhood. I'll come back to what personhood is. In a sociocultural context, who we are as people is not independent of our culture and society. That's what gives meaning to who we are as people. And secondly, we need to understand the relationship between self and family, self and community, family and community, and culture. Okay, so it, that gets at your question a little bit, which is this is like a task for all of us when we are working with people who have experienced um, armed conflict, migration, involuntary and voluntary migration, um, and particularly when people are shifting from culture to culture, and it's a pretty major shift. Okay. Make sense enough to keep going? Okay. So there's a guy named Arthur Kleinman. He's a psychiatrist and an anthropologist. He's done a lot of work in China and in other countries. And I just like this quote by him, and I'll stand here so I can look at you while I read it. The construction of self involves a dialectic between universal biological and social aspects of human nature. Just want to pause there. There are universal things about being a person, okay? And some of it's biological and some of it's social. On the one side, and then the process of creating meaning in particular social interactions based on shared cultural models and value orientations. And that's the part where we're very different. And that's the part where I think many of your questions get at which is a lot of the people who are coming here ha come from social, cultural models and value orientations that perhaps are not um, Western. And again, I want to put that in quotes because this country is a pretty diverse country. There are lots of people living in this country who have migrated here from Africa, Latin America, South America, um, Asia, and don't necessarily have quote, Western value system. So I don't want to generalize that everybody in this country has that. But still, moving to Northampton, it's a fairly white community. It's um, a very progressive community. But it's certainly not um, an Asian community, right, or an African community, like certain neighborhoods are in New York or San Francisco or Seattle, right? Making sense? OK. So culture and personhood, I mentioned this notion of personhood. This shapes what we think, what we feel, how we react to something, how we express what we are feeling. And I just want to give a very brief um, anecdote. When I went to Sri Lanka after the tsunami, and I was talking to a man in eastern Sri Lanka who had lost family members and had seen his whole village disappear, he smiled at me as he was telling me his story, OK? So he was describing the most awful, tragic losses, and he was smiling. And it took me a while to understand why he was doing that. And he explained it to me over time, um, which was that he didn't want me to feel badly by contaminating me with his sorrow, and that that was something cultural. But I w I'd be very hard pressed to find somebody in Northampton who would be smiling, describing what he was talking about. So how we express what we're feeling really differs, um, and culture makes a, is, is a big part of that. How we make sense and meaning about what happened. So for people who are moving here, for refugees, it's making sense of what happened in their host countries. And let, you know, that's the other thing, which is there were lots of disempowering things going on before people arrived here. And then making this huge transition and making sense about what is happening here. And what do people need to feel better? And who can offer us what we need? Like, if you were experiencing 
a lot of anxiety, or if, you were or if you felt you had the symptoms of trauma, or if you were becoming depressed, I would imagine a lot of people in this room would seek a therapist, okay? Especially in Northampton where <laughs> <laughs> we need to keep those therapists going. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people who will be, who are already live in our community, who are immigrants, who are moving to this community, who will be part of this project, who would not necessarily think of going to a therapist with those types of symptoms. And the meaning of those symptoms would even be construed differently than I just described them, okay? So personhood is part of what we need to try and understand. We have to understand our own personhood as well as the personhood of somebody else. And that's something we're always doing, but it's much easier when we come from similar backgrounds. Like I grew up in New York, I'm Jewish, so if I meet a New York Jew here, and there are plenty of us, um, there's certain shared cultural assumptions about personhood that we don't have to negotiate or spend time trying to understand. And I think understanding people's personhood is a very big part of your challenge and your task. The guy who came up with this notion is Derek Summerfield. He's an English psychiatrist. And he said what we have to really be careful about is what he called the medicalization of human suffering. And he, he was really reacting to the fact that Western psychologists and social workers and psychiatrists, sorry, was that? Okay. We're going into countries where people were suffering a lot and saying, oh, PTSD, everybody has PTSD. Everybody needs this kind of treatment. And he said, whoa, that's really not okay. That's in some ways a form of neocolonialism. Um, it's imposing Western personhood on people who are not Western and have a different sense of personhood. So he asked questions like, what kinds of risks can be faced? And that really varies depending on personhood. Things that would really throw me don't necessarily throw people who I've worked with in Taiwan, for example. Um, and so I, I've gone through some of these questions, but here's a few to think, for us to think about. What do you share and not share with people outside of your family, right? I mean, all of us have a sense of who we talk to and what's okay to share and what it isn't, isn't okay to share. But certainly if I'm having a dinner party with friends and they're similar to me, we will pretty much be on the same page about what we share. But what he's saying is that's actually something we need to try to understand and be cautious about. Asking, and it gets back to some of the things you asked, asking questions about like um, feelings maybe is something that um, you might be comfortable with and people you hang out with are comfortable with. But we just can't assume that the person coming from a very different context is comfortable with that or even understands what it means. So let's just do a shout out. And I'm going to try and restrain myself and not comment <laughs> uh, on everything anybody says. So who do you go to for help when you're experiencing a crisis? Just yell it out one at a time. Partner, friend, spouse. Yes. Professional. Professionals, okay. So we're starting to diverge a little bit from family to professionals. Anybody else? Friends. Friends. Work associates. Work associates. Okay, so just so far what's really interesting to me, if I do this in other contexts or with a class where I have greater diversity, people go to religious uh, people a lot. A lot more than I heard. I didn't hear it at all here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, any, anything else anybody wants to share on? Huh? Neighbors. Okay. Okay. So sometimes it's people really close to us. Sometimes it's people who live in proximity to us. Sometimes we pay for it. Um, but it's interesting. There's, there's a pretty strong degree of consensus about who we go to for help compared to, like I said, a more diverse group we'd get probably a greater range of answers. Um, what were some of the lessons you learned from your family? Don't talk about problems. Don't, don't talk about problems. Don't ask for help. <laughs> don't ask for All right, so let me just, we got the two negative people over here. <laughs> Does, any, did anybody come from families where you were told, talk about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. All right. Talk to <laughs> But then you learn it's situational. I mean, 
some family members some issues? Some right. You, you make conscious choices. It's not just a general rule. Yeah. Is it part of it, too, the period we were born in? I mean, people weren't seeing therapists when I was growing up. Right. People didn't, like, there wasn't a culture of talking about problems. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's like culture is not static. And um, probably where you, when you and I grew up, I'm assuming we're more or less in the same cohort, it's not the same as somebody who's 15 today. Yeah. Uh, not to mention differences in race, class, uh, geographic area, culture. Yeah. Plow through it. OK, plow through it. So persevere. Persevere, be strong. Yeah. Self-reliance. Self-reliance, which now how many people maybe had a different thing other than self-reliance, like I'm not alone and I need help. And that's interesting, not or one person. My experience is, again, just having come from northern Uganda, it's the opposite. Don't be self-reliant. You're part of a clan. You're part of a community. And um, you can't do it on your own. And if you try, you're going to fail. And it's actually an insult to other people. So any other lessons that anybody wants to share? You can get to anything about how bad it is. Okay. So that's a kind of optimistic. It might be hard. I might take a lot of punches, but I can keep going. None of us were taught to give up. Is that from what I'm hearing? OK. Probably that's, I'm just guessing, true of most people who are coming to this community as refugees. It might not be the same thing about you could do it on your own, or you should persevere. but. In most cultures, people are taught lessons about how to survive. And if there's one thing the folks that we are going to be working with have learned how to do, it's survive. OK, so I'm going to move us on. This is a, a, a diagram. It's the social ecology of disaster. What I was trying to show, and I think it relates to what, was, what we will be experiencing when people move here, is that there are, there's like the disaster. Let's just say in Syria, there's the uh, incredibly complicated civil war. And there are people who are affected. There are communities who are affected. So it's not just individuals, but entire towns, uh, cities, a country is coming apart. But there are also all these things on the outside that shape how we make sense of it. And whether it's religious differences, political dynamics, dictators um, or democracy, resources that people have, social networks and capital, the media and its relationship, because there's lots of things going on in the world that we're not reading about or hearing about that are pretty yucky. But they don't make it into our consciousness because they don't, the media doesn't cover them. So I guess I just want to say that all the people moving here come from communities where there is this social ecology, right? It was a moving target, it kept changing, and they're now entering a very different social ecology. So their journey took them, like I'm thinking of a Syrian person who's been working with the planning group that I've been involved with who keeps describing his journey and what it was like from a fairly stable life um, and hope and potential upward mobility to complete threats and chaos. Um, to arriving here in a totally different social ecology and having to make that adjustment, which of course shapes personhood. And so personhood is also an evolving thing. It's not a fixed thing. But I just think it's a helpful thing to keep in mind to try and understand what was the social ecology of the people who come here like before they arrived? How did it change before they came here? And how is this social ecology different for them? Does that make sense? OK. So when people enter a new social ecology, I think there are some key themes. And this is the first time I've rolled this one out, so I'm interested in any feedback. Cultural and social familiarity to cultural and social dissonance. And what I mean by that is sometimes people leave a situation where things, they understand things. They understand the meaning of a person's behavior, uh, whether it's public or private, and they feel 
ex like they're experts. In fact, they don't even have to think about it because they understand it. And yet, if you move to a place that's really different, you can be suddenly, it's almost like being adrift at sea and not really being able to make sense of what's around you. And so that's, I think, a real factor when people shift social ecologies in a very dramatic way, a sudden way, or profound a profoundly different way. So another theme, I think, is knowledge of self and society. I know who I am. I know my society. I know where I fit in my society. I know what to expect in my society. And to suddenly find oneself in a position of not knowing. Okay? I don't really know how to make sense of this. Um, I'm not sure of how I fit in. I'm not sure how to make sense of that behavior that I just saw. And very often people in their host societies and cultures have very clear social roles. You are a such and such. I am a such and such. Um, this is where I fit in. Here's the social hierarchy. And here's my place in it. And here's what people expect from me and what I can expect from other people. And I think what can happen is social roles then start to become ambiguous. And there are very dramatic examples of that when people, like, I go, it was mentioned that I go to Alberta and to Calgary. And anytime I'm picked up from the airport and taken to my hotel, it's usually somebody with a PhD in engineering um, or somebody who was a professor in Nepal. And they've moved. And now they're, they're working as a taxi driver. So they've had to make an incredible shift um, to what their social role in society is. And they're struggling with it even though they've been there for a while, they speak fluent English. But just think if you suddenly had to move to another country and you couldn't do what you currently do, and there were very limited options open to you, not to mention linguistic and cultural differences, and how, that, how, how would that make you feel about yourself and who you are? And you couldn't just take for granted things that you can perhaps take for granted in your host society. I think another theme is challenges to traditional family roles and processes. Um, you know, that we have certain expectations about what roles should be in a family, um, what, the ro what gender roles should be, what hierarchies there are or aren't between children and parents, what the role of extended family members is, where the boundaries should be drawn. And um, even if a family comes here in an intact way, and they're pretty clear about how they want to relate to one another, they're not living in a bubble anymore. They weren't beforehand, but they were living in a more um, resonant kind of society. But kids are going to go to school, and they're going to experience how other kids are and how they are with their parents. And they're going to experience other families. They're going to be other people living in the neighborhood or in the same apartment building. So, no matter how clear you are when you first arrive about what roles are and how people should operate in a family, that's going to be challenged over time. And that's a pretty threatening thing. It's a pretty hard thing to adjust to. And again, I ask all of us to think about what would it be like if you and assuming you have a partner um, were suddenly moved into a very different culture and society and your kids were with you, and they start hanging out with other kids, and they start learning very different things than you've been teaching them, or behaving in very different ways, or the role of women or the role of men is incredibly different from what you're used to here, and how that would affect you. So changes in social status, I think the example I gave about Calgary is just a, one of many we could come up with. Issues of safety, security, and vulnerability. And I want to come back to that because um, I want to share with you some research about what, is the most, what are the most important things for people to experience to be able to move forward in their lives. And if they've experienced disasters, catastrophes, or wars, to survive and thrive. But safety is the first one. And again, think of what your sense of safety is or isn't. Uh, and why you feel that way, and how secure you feel, and what gives you confidence in that security, 
And think of the times you've felt vulnerable when you haven't had that. And I would assume that a lot of people moving here, um, there will be challenges to their sense of security and their sense of safety. I don't know exactly what they will be, but certainly um, that's, those are issues that come up for me when I'm suddenly thrust in a different context. And lastly, a sense of confidence versus a lack of confidence. That, again, I feel pretty confident talking to all of you in this context right now, but I could certainly be thrust into a different situation where I'd have no idea about how people were reading me, understanding me, how, what they were thinking about what I was saying. That could certainly make me start feeling very insecure, and I might lack confidence about my abilities to communicate, to present myself as I want to present myself, to be understood as I want to be understood. So I'm not assuming any of these things. I'm really trying to sketch out what I think are some themes that we could be at least alert to that are possibly going to be dynamics or struggles for people who are entering our community as refugees. Yeah. Right. Um, like, you know, we might be working with a family who looks at gender in a very different way right. or looks at same-sex relationships in a different kind of way. And so I think that can make us feel insecure. And, and right. so I'm just wondering how, how we deal with that. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because it's not like um, everybody here feels secure all the time. And when you're doing this kind of work, it can challenge your own sense of what's right and wrong or how you should be. But here's what I see as the major difference, which is, so you're interacting, <coughs> excuse me, with this family, but the society and culture in general is reinforcing probably who you are. You could certainly then go home or talk to your friends or talk to your colleagues, <coughs> excuse me, and in a sense, uh, reinvigorate your sense of who you are normally and even if you felt temporarily threatened, you're surrounded by a lot of reinforcing, supportive people and messages and symbols. And I think when we have isolated families, they don't have that. So I think one of the lessons for me in what you said is how can we help them to create that? How can they generate what you have when you're feeling threatened and you could draw on and it might be harder for them to muster? So that's not necessarily what we do directly with families, but how do we help create the um, social supports that we take for granted in our own communities? Any other questions or comments on that? Yeah, Jeff. Um, it seems like we may be missing from this list is a question of how you foster trust. So going back to when we were having our discussions, so all of us rely on people that we feel like we can trust. Right. But these people are going to come here and they don't know us and they're supposed to rely at least in part on us. Right. With people with whom they have no trust. They have not have to make at least the, the obstacles between us. But um, and trust seems like a very deep personal attachment. So how do you Yeah, no, I'm how do you make that I'm glad you brought it up, Barry. Um, you're absolutely right that for you and your roles uh, as members of Circles of Care, trust has to, you have to work to establish trust. I wouldn't assume that people don't trust you, you know, I, I, but that's certainly a possibility. And again, how quickly trust is established is also very situational and very culturally bound. And I, I think there are certain situations where within a few moments, somebody might feel like, okay, I can, this is safe, I can trust you. And in other situations, it could take years. And there could also be trust that gets built up, and then it can be undermined. So there's no quick or simple answer to that, and you're absolutely right. It's really important to think about how, how you can be your, your authentic self in a way that doesn't, um, impose your values on another person, and how you can help them to trust you if that's a safe thing for them to do. But yes, I'm glad you added that, and I should definitely put that on there and think about that. Again, talking to some of the immigrants and refugees in this area, 
uh, there was a lot of mistrust of people in their host countries before they came here. And for some of them, they actually trust people here more. In fact, sometimes the problem is they trust people too much and can become vulnerable. So I think, again, all these things are dimensions. There's no like right answer, but trust is another dimension that um, has to be established, it has to be worked on, it has to be modulated, um, and we can't predict exactly how to do it other than to be authentic, to be attentive, um, and to take our cues from the person we're talking with. I think that's really important. <coughs> Anything else? Yeah. Just thinking about a sense of belonging. Yeah. And you know, how that would be established for these families. Okay, I'm going to come to that. So that's I got have that on another slide. So I'm going to hold that one. <laughs> Cindy. Yeah. And not having particularly an attentive, any, not really <coughs> high, the possibility of having community with other people that might come from the country like, that might exist in Springfield. So yeah. I think that's a particular challenge here in terms of building a sense of, of social community and trust. Yeah. No, I'm glad you brought that up. So it's not just about <coughs> culture. It's not just about not knowing people. Um, but as Jenny said, I do a lot of work in anti-racism. There's, there's, there's a lot of racism that's going on here all the time. And even though most white people in this community are um, well-intentioned, try to understand how, how that works, my experience is that most white people, and I include myself, are not really cognizant of the daily threats to uh, security, to safety, to respect that many people of color experience in Northampton and in Amherst um, and in Springfield. And, and that definitely is a theme. Jenny mentioned that I um, have a, had a State Department grant where I was bringing, oh, thanks so much, that's great. That's, I'll be up all night if I <laughs> <laughs> So I appreciate it, thanks. I was bringing Rwandans and Northern Ugandans here. I think we had six different groups or eight different groups. And um, each group experienced this. They really were really trusting. They were really excited about being here. Um, they experienced the majority of people as being really friendly. But then after a few days or uh, you know, after a week, they started experiencing some things where people were afraid of them, uh, where people said rude things to them. Um, where they were being followed by the police. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times people say, what, really, that was going on? And if I said this to, for example, my colleague who I co-authored the racism book with, who's African-American Puerto Rican, she's like always telling me what it's like to be in Northampton as a very visibly visible person of color. Um, if she goes into a store and gives a credit card, they ask to see ID. I've never once been asked to show my ID. Um, when she's planning how to drive back to New York, she's always very careful about what route she takes in case she breaks down, um, which I never really have to think about. So, you know, and I had a, um, a colleague who was standing outside the dorm just not nearby here, near Elm Street, and, and a car drove by, a pickup truck drove by, and somebody yelled at the N-word and so said, go home and use the N-word. So, you know, again, it's like, it, that's a real shock. It's a real surprise, but it really does happen. So you're right, that is likely to be part of what will make people feel unsafe uh, when they're here. And that's, we can't control the fact that there's racism. So I think one of the questions is how to be supportive to people when they encounter it and experience it. And is there a way you can prepare people for that without making them paranoid? Um, because again, the majority of people are really uh, decent and, and reach out to people and are supportive. So we have to be thoughtful about that as well. I'm going to move on only because we're going to run out of time and we won't have a chance to, to talk too much. Um, so here's eight things that 
I've learned really help people to recover after a disaster or armed conflict I think are really helpful to keep in mind. It cuts across all cultures, all societies, and Hotfall and about 20 people wrote this seminal article in 2007. There's a bibliography at the end of this, by the way, and I'm happy to make this available to you, Susan, and then you, you can distribute it so you don't have to, you know, anything jump over too quickly. So the first five come from that article, and then the, the other three I've added from other sources. Okay, so the first thing is achieving a sense of safety. Okay, so we can't, and I think that relates to trust, but people have to feel safe to settle down, to start um, living their lives, to not be hyper alert, to uh, be able to take in information, to be able to form relationships. Again, I'm not telling you how we make people feel safe, but we need to pay attention to how to help people feel safe, and I would add secure uh, at the same time. And if you have ideas about it, please speak up. The ability to self-calm. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety that can go with uh, being an immigrant, let alone being a refugee, let alone really moving to a country that's very different culturally. So people, and as, as you pointed out, sometimes people are carrying trauma or stress uh, and anxiety. And the actual act of moving here can sometimes re-trigger some of the things that people are, are already holding. So what's been found is when people learn how to calm themselves down and don't have to rely on other people, that helps them to start feeling a sense of safety and security. All right, and that could be through breathing exercises, it could be through cooking, it could be through playing soccer. Um, there's lots of ways of calming down, but what's been shown is that it's really important that people learn how to calm themselves down when they're agitated. The third one, and this is really important, people need a sense of competency. They need a sense of self-efficacy. And again, with the, some of the examples I gave earlier, there's a lot of threats to comp, a sense of competence, confidence, and self-efficacy when you're moving into such a radically different environment. You don't speak the language. Your skills are not recognized. You don't understand society and culture in the same uh, authoritative way. So, how can we help people to feel competent? That's really a very important question for you to keep thinking about when you're working with a family. What will help them to feel competent? And again, there's lots of ways to do that. Asking people to teach you how to cook a certain kind of food. Um, asking people to explain the meaning of a religious practice. That in itself, if, you know, assuming a person feels comfortable talking about it, can help them to feel competent because they're teaching you something. They're showing you something. Or they're doing something that they're good at. So that's really important because the world of what they're good at has shrunk considerably as they make this transition. And I think one of your tasks is how do you expand it again? Okay. How do you help expand that world? Connections with other people and resources. Again, you know, you could say, duh, of course, everybody needs connections, but think of the, the connections that have been severed when a family has moved here under the circumstances that many of the refugees are moving here. They have extended family that are still in their host country. They might have seen people who were killed. They might have lost people. Um, they, and it gets back to trust. And so, the connections are not just with you, but how do you help them establish connections with other people who will be meaningful connections for them? But that in itself is an incredibly important thing. One of the things we've talked about in the group of therapists that's been meeting is like how important it could be for an adolescent to be part of a team and um, to be with playing some kind of sport that's familiar and doing it with other people, having fun with other people, um, having that sense of com camaraderie that comes with being part of a team. That's just a very simple um, elementary type of example of a way of trying to help foster connections for somebody that goes beyond just the connection with you. Make sense? And the fifth thing that Hopfall and Watson and all of the people who wrote this realized is recovering a sense of hope. And that's a tough one because 
really for people to move on with their lives, they need a sense of hope. But on the other hand, if you are really kind of like a cheerleader and talking about how much promise and how much hope there is, and again, going back to personhood and that whole notion of when to be fatalistic or when to be optimistic, that doesn't help either. So I guess it's important to realize that ultimately, families who move here need to reestablish a sense of hope. Some will come with it already. Some might have lost it, and it has to be rekindled. The pilot light's gone out. Um, but at some point, hope will be an essential part of their moving forward with their lives. Here's the three things that I've added, and I think they apply to, to this situation. People need to grieve and mourn in culturally meaningful ways. People don't just grieve and mourn when people die. People grieve and mourn when they lose their homeland, when they lose their country, um, when they lose their community. And so I think for most immigrants, and particularly for refugees, there's often a process of grieving and mourning that's taking place. And I think we just have to understand that and recognize that that's important to go through. And I can't say exactly how people should go through it, but I'd be surprised if there isn't some grieving and mourning that needs to take place. And again, it has to be in culturally meaningful ways. And I don't know what those ways are, but that's a general principle I would put forward. Now this one is a really interesting one. Judith Landau developed this after 9-11. It's really important for people to reestablish connections with cultural practices and lessons learned from ancestors. She actually talked about something called transitional pathways, that in this moment, we are conscious of our past, and we feel a connection with our past, and we also are thinking about the future. That's what gives meaning to this moment, right? Where we've come from, and what cultural traditions and practices led to our, our being here, and what we look forward to. And if you think of refugees, very often their connections with cultural practices are certainly challenged, if not severed, by moving here. And it gets back to the hope thing, which is their sense of what their future holds is perhaps quite cloudy. And so that then can affect their sense of security, their sense of meaning in the present moment. So I know this is very ambiguous and conceptual, but I think that I would say that one of the things, and I'll come back to this with a later slide, that we have to try to do is to reopen the transitional pathways between the past and the future as they inform the present. And I'll come back to that. Does that make enough sense that I can move on? OK. And the last thing, and this, somebody had said this, and I said I'd get to it, it's reestablishing a sense of place. These, we all need a sense of place. And that you know, sense of place could be our dwelling. It could be our community. But that has been undermined, even no matter how smoothly it went, by going through this transition. People have lost their sense of place. And so just arriving here and being shown a home and being introduced to a circle of care and a new community that's part of helping people to reestablish a sense of place. But I wouldn't minimize it. It's a really central plank of a family and individual feeling as if their world is secure and they have a foundation and then they can explore from that safe place. Does that make sense? You sure? OK. I saw a few ambiguous looks there. At least that's how I culturally read it. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through the, some of these fairly quickly because it's already a little after 8, and I really do want to open this up. And, um, and we really must end at 8.30, or else I'm just going to topple over. <laughs> so here's my critique of Western trauma approaches, especially when we're dealing with refugees from non-Western countries. There's this focus on universal biophysical reactions. Everybody has trauma. Everybody has depression. Okay, that's, these are universal, and it doesn't matter what culture you're from. If you have problems like the ones I just described, trained professionals need to provide counseling or therapy to help you. Um, there tends to be a sensitivity to psychiatric pathology that has resulted from being a refugee, from experiencing armed conflict, 
oh my God, just think of all the terrible things that happened to that person and all the um, psychological syndromes that this has generated um, as a person arrives here. And the Western trauma approach tends to administer counseling and therapy techniques with individuals and groups. The last part, th this one here I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but this one, that the therapist is the expert. Okay, that's a really disempowering thing, especially for people who have not had therapy as a normative part of their lives, to then have to see an expert who's telling them what's going on with them using terminology and concepts that are unfamiliar to them, right? So I know I've exaggerated my critique here, okay? I, I know therapists quite well, and, um, <laughs> and, they do, and even a few of you in this room do some really good things. But that's my kind of, that's how I approach this from a critical lens. So here's, um, oh, I hadn't finished that. Okay, well. <laughs> a bigger critique. <laughs> I've forgotten how many slides I had on it. But so there's a focus on trauma, and as I said, a minority of people develop trauma even when they've experienced terrible events. There's a focus on the individual at the expense of family, group, and community. A lot of problems are solved within families or within groups or within communities, and not just by individuals but we tend to see things as individual problems that need professional help to solve them. Um, and it's really not helpful to think of people as victims. And the last one, and you know the word iatrogenic? No. Or, that's like unintentional uh, bad effects. Tom, what does it mean? <laughs> huh? No, no. I know the term all too well. <laughs> yes, I know you. That's why I'm asking you for the definition. No, no, go ahead. I don't want to interfere. All right, my understanding. I would say it comes from experience as um, a bioethicist in a hospital. Good intentions can sometimes lead to bad consequences. Yeah. Okay. So is that that's a simple way of I'm trying to say. Um, so. That's, these are all the kinds of things we have to be careful of that might seem normative to many of us in this room. So psychosocial capacity building, which is the model I was telling you about that I've been working on, we look at sources of strength and resilience. All right, so that's really important. We start at that point. We really look at what are the assets that the family brings? What are the strengths within this family? What have they survived and what did they learn about themselves and survival from these experiences? Second thing. Psychological well-being is not, never separate from social well-being. And so the two go together. They're, they're a kind of recursive circle. And so if you start helping families with their social well-being, you probably are helping them with their psychological well-being and vice versa. Respect for natural healing processes. And again, in our society and culture at this moment, in this community, um, a lot of times, we don't respect natural healing processes and feel like we have to intervene. We have to add something. Whenever possible to utilize local people and resources, training of trainers. So what I'm saying is if there are people, like if, there, if somebody's here from Burundi and there's a Burundian community in the area, but the folks in that community are not aware of how to be supportive and helpful, then how can we work with them to be helpful to the family who has arrived in a way that supports them. And there's a kind of interact. We're, in a sense, using our uh, resources, our power, our expertise to try and help other people who have the ability to be even more helpful. Cultural practices are centralized. They're not just, oh, but, and yet we have to think about culture. But they're central. And that's really, I think, if there's anything I've been trying to say through this talk tonight, um, it's to centralize them. And so that people in supportive and professional roles, as I feel everybody in this room is, um, we offer consultation and support, but we don't take over. That's really important. To you know, be supportive in a kind of behind the scenes way or lowering ourselves way and not in a directive, hierarchical, taking over kind of way. And then again, the iatrogenic effects, which is caution about unintended effects. So I'm going to have to skip some slides only because of the time, because I do want to make sure we have time to talk about this. 
and just hit some of the key ones. But again, I'll make this available to everybody. Um, so what does this look like in practice with refugees? So we have to find and form partnerships with other people, groups, and organizations who are socially and culturally familiar to the refugees. Okay, that's a really basic thing. Second thing, being inquisitive and learning from each family. So we have to enter this in a way where we don't assume that we know what's going on and how can we put them in the role of expert and learn from their experience. Which again, going back to those eight things I talked about, it helps with self-efficacy when people are put in that role of expert. Assuming competence, so let's assume competence as the starting point and knowing that there, is, there are specialized professional resources available when needed. That that's not the starting point. That's the kind of like safety valve if we need it. But that we assume competence as the starting point. Whenever plans are being made, and again, this would be a much richer conversation if we had refugees in the group tonight, okay? So that would be something I would really recommend, which is including refugees and other key stakeholders when planning how to be responsive. Transparency, that's something I've learned um, really goes a long way when making suggestions about motives, transparency about what your motives are, why you're making this suggestion, what your hope for goals are by making this suggestion, what your rationale is, what are the possible benefits if the family does this, and also what are the risks. So just being perhaps more transparent than you would with somebody who shares your cultural assumptions and who you already have a relationship with, where you can just say, okay, here's what I think you need to do. Go to bed, take two aspirin, um, you know, and don't get up until your fever has gone down. So yeah, I don't have to be transparent about why I'm saying that to a person who I'm culturally close to and familiar with. But I think that in that situation, I might have to, be, I might have to stop at each point as to why I'm saying that. Well, here's why I think aspirin might help. This is why I think going to bed might help. Here's what the downside of it might be. I think you have to really, in a sense, almost be narrating what you're doing with the person that you're trying to help as you're doing it, if that makes sense. Attunement to sociocultural factors, and we've talked about this, such as racism, Islamophobia, those are two big ones here, challenges to values and traditions, and the impact of all of this on the family. And here's what I think will be one of the hardest things for people in this community, is working with people who have very different values about gender roles, for example, or about communication, and how to accept that, how to um, be respectful of that, even if it really challenges some very deeply felt values that we've uh, basically generated during our lives. Last two, organically building on a foundation of natural and familiar activities and practices. Starting particularly with things that are familiar and really looking at what was your life like before you came here? What did you get pleasure from? What are the things that gave you meaning? And let's think about what are the ways you can have some of that now here. And again, it might not be directly through you, but through some other groups or people. But start with what's familiar and natural for people before people have to start leaving their comfort zone and exploring this kind of learning edge of what it's like to be in this new society. And seeking activities and opportunities that foster self-efficacy. I know I keep bringing this up, but to constantly think of that. What makes people feel empowered? What makes people feel good about themselves? Okay. Um, the rest of the slides look at resilience, and I'll let you look at them um, when you have a chance to read them. And, and for each type of resilience, I've tried at the bottom to look at, you know, like emotional resilience. What are some? Of, what does the research say about what fosters emotional resilience? And then for you, what are the implications? So if we look at emotional resilience, how can you help people set future goals? How can you help them offer? How can you help offer hope? And, or rekindle hope? How can you teach them self-calming techniques if they don't know that? Or how can you help find people who can teach them that? So with each of these slides, I try to bring it down to earth and look at activities and things that you can do. Um, and then the last thing is I, I just feel that groups are really helpful in helping people. And I kind of make the case as to why I think they're helpful and some different kinds of groups 
and things that should be parts of groups. And then this last thing I, that I talked about earlier, the transitional pathways, which I've kind of gone over. Um, and I guess the question is, how can we help people to reconstruct their transitional pathways, which is their connection with their past and their um, hopes for the future, their intentions, their plans, and their goals. Those are always part of our lives, and we're not necessarily even conscious of it. But when we lose it, we can stall. Okay, we can really, our, our forward movement in our lives can stall out. And so how can we help people to reconstruct and rebuild these transitional pathways? And that's it. So I'm going to stop there and open it up for discussion. And then there's a bit of a So let's open it up. Yeah. I just want to mention the, the language barrier issue. Okay. It just feels so like, you know, we're working with uh, two Congolese brothers who've been here like three weeks, four weeks. And, you know, it's, it's like not having the language and, and it's going through the intense process of learning a language. So, I mean, there's, you know, we've been connecting them with people who speak French. So right. that's been, I think, really helpful to have that's great. The support of their home language as they learn English. But just, you know, I, I feel like that's just, I, I see that, that it's, you know, it's, it's exhausting, it's tiring, it's, it's frustrating, you know, on both sides. You just have yeah. to try and bridge the gap, pantomime these translators, not know what they're saying, not, you know, just, just all that. I just want to mention that. No, I'm glad you brought it up. And, and obviously, there's no solution to that. Right. You don't, you don't, I don't even not sure what, what language they speak, what their primary language well, is. French uh, and uh, Swahili. Swahili. Swahili, okay. French. Right. But already, but in what you just said, you described ways you're trying to deal with that. And yes, absolutely, it's, it's a terrible constriction. Yeah. When you think of a lot of the things I've covered, it's hard to achieve them if you can't communicate with people, or if you can only communicate with people in a very limited, constricted way. Um, but I, you know, I was really liking what you were saying, which is, you know, you're using, I'm assuming, more pantomime than you would use with me. Um, and I like what you thought about with French, which is that they come from a country where, because there's tribes speaking different languages, and this is true in Uganda with English, um, and in lots of African countries that are either Francophile or Anglophile countries, or ang Anglophone, Francophone countries. Um, that that becomes the unifying language that we're actually, that's what they're speaking in their country with somebody from another tribe who speaks a, a very different language. So, you know, thinking of that and trying to see that as, as a common ground and try, and then I think what you also mentioned is how do you work with interpreters? You know, that, that is a really, uh, I mean, how can you help empower interpreters and how can you help them to be effective in their role? Um, because that must be very liberating for the family that somebody's able to speak their language. Um, and yet, it sounds like part, there might be some wariness about what they're saying or what they're encouraging the family to do. So how can they be incorporated as part of the team? But maybe other people have other ideas about what to do with this well, issue. A couple, yeah. a couple other things. You know, yeah. Some of us thought it would be really cool you know, to invite these brothers into high school French class because they know French and, and they can have a conversation with students about, you know, in French about their, their experience. They weren't interested in that at all. Okay. And then, uh, you know, we, we had this brilliant idea of finding a Congolese church for them. They weren't interested in that. So it's like, you know, having a give and, give and take about how, to, how we think they can, you know, whether it's bridge the language barrier or just connect around that. It's, you know, you just can't assume that, that we know what they are interested in. Well, I, again, I really like what you're saying, which is that you were trying to generate ideas that fit in with a lot of what we've been talking about tonight that would have been empowering, and then you, but you didn't say, let's do it. Right. You suggested it, but then you heard them say they didn't want to do it. And I, I'm also hearing that probably you needed to be transparent mm -hmm. about why you thought it might be a good idea, and you also had to be respectful as about why they thought it's not what they wanted to do. And so this is an um, interactive process that's going on, and it's iterative. And I think that um, it, it sounds like it's evolving. So that's, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I guess everything I'm hearing sounds great, even though it must be frustrating at times. Yeah. Uh, you and then you, yes. I think the most positive thing that we've, we've found with the brothers we're working with 
is that we allowed them to say no. We kept saying, you don't have to do this. We're asking you, would you like to? And at first, everything was smiles and yes, yes, yes. And I've come to the point where they're comfortable enough to say, we don't want to do that. So that's great. And, 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 and again, if we think of the social ecology, part of that is colonialism. And you know, by being white, or appearing as white, and trying to be helpful, you know, I have this all the time when I'm working in Africa, which is that people are constantly agreeing with me and elevating me into this role of expert that I don't necessarily want to in, um, inhabit. And I, and I guess, um, so that's an important thing to work through, which is, you know, wait a minute, this is a nego negotiated process. And you could say no to me, and it sounds like you were able to, to do that, but there's reasons why initially it didn't start out that way. You know, and some of that's uh, our colonial heritage, and some of that's just you're the person who lives here, and they're the newcomers. There's a lot of reasons. But to be sensitive to that, and to try and encourage people to exercise their boundaries and their autonomy, which it sounds like you did. Well, I think what you said is also important. It's an evolution. They're yeah. evolving, we're evolving, and we're learning how to do this together. And that's a great way to approach it, and I think that's really important. It's mutual. You know, you're not just helping them. It's really interesting. I needed some help with some things recently, and um, with some of my colleagues uh, and even former students, you know, at first I was very hesitant to, you know, like be vulnerable and engage them in that way. And what they were saying is, we really want to be able to be helpful. And so I think the same thing is true here. I think that um, it's really important that um, it's mutual and that you're not just helping them, but they're helping you. You know, you're, you're not entering this as a therapist where you're only there to meet their needs. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, in terms of the two uh, brothers who are 23 and 26, right. one of the things they're really interested in, they're very good at, is playing soccer. And uh, we got them involved in Amherst in a tournament. They played right. four games last Saturday morning. Right. And they came back, they got ribbons with medals. Right. <laughs> they were so proud of those. And they their sense of competence. Yeah, I mean, their sense of competence, it's familiar, um, it's a social connection. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that I've covered, and some of the things I kind of didn't get to talk about tonight that, that happened when, when, when they did that. And it sounds like they wanted to do that, and they had fun. Yeah. It generated positive emotions doing that, mm -hmm. I would imagine. And ask them which English Premier Soccer League team they support. One person invited over to watch twice, but it's Manchester United, of course. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Everywhere in Africa, when you go into like a print shop or anything, there's there are posters and calendars from the team that the owner supports. That has like all the players, the dates of the matches. When the when the, when the matches are taking place, people go to people's homes or to a bar to watch it. So that, you know, that's another thing, which that's probably, you know, again, it's learning what, what their reality was like before they came here. But that's a part of it. And especially if you're a young man, having come from, I don't know where in the Congo, but probably this was part of their lives. Yeah. Um, well, I, I was assuming that these two brothers from the Congo would really benefit from me meeting other people from the Congo. But I learned that that's not such a simple thing. Right. <laughs> there, there is another family that just moved here from, I guess they were in a Rwanda already? Yeah, they, they were, I think, from the Congo. Right, they're from the Congo. There's a lot of ethnic uh, similarities and, and going right. back and forth, depending on where the war is taking and, place. And they don't necessarily want to meet yes. everybody who speaks Swahili. So I, I, it's kind of confusing. But, but, but that's a good example of what I was trying to get at earlier, which is, um, you know, what do you share with people? Um, how do, and, you know, Barry's point about how do you establish trust. And I, like, for example, I had a student who was living in Maine working with uh, Somalis who were refugees. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she didn't realize is that there were clan differences and power struggles going on. Mm -hmm. And she kept stepping into it, trying to bring people together. And they actually were uh, very mistrustful of one another. And we're having a lot of conflict with one another. So trying to, so respecting that, but also trying to perhaps understand it. Where is it coming from? Who do they want to meet? You know, like, you thought this might be helpful. They don't particularly want to do it. So what would be helpful? What would give them meaning? What would be pleasurable? What would help them to feel secure? What would help them to 
reestablish a sense of place. Yeah. I'm also wondering if for some refugees, especially younger ones, they want to put that away. And we kind of pathologize that. Right. Um, and maybe they don't. They want to be with Americans. And they want to be like an American. And they want to do it fast. And I think we need to be sensitive. I remember my parents were Holocaust survivors, and I was talking to a therapist once about my mother and how some of her really positive coping mechanisms, and, and actually this was a, a supervisor, and she said, oh, so your mother's in massive denial. <laughs> no, that's a great example. And, and so I think sometimes we have to honor that, that that's how people want to do it, and if that's their path is, is blocking out the past and, and moving forward, that's their, that's their method. I, I agree with what you're saying, and to me, again, that gets back to the notion of personhood. And if their notion of their personhood involves that happened, that's the past, and I don't deal with it anymore, I move on, I feel like I have to respect that. You know, again, I, I, I feel like I'd be imposing my professional and cultural values by saying, I think you're in denial. I think it's really going to come back to haunt you. I, I think that it's important to respect what, what the person's saying and, and to understand that Maybe they're in denial, but maybe actually this is a great coping mechanism and it's working for them. Yeah. I think my, uh, my wife's family came here after World War II from the Philippines and their way was to just become as Americanized as possible and it didn't seem, I mean they had you know, been living in the jungle during, during the war, and, I mean, but it, didn't, it doesn't seem at all to apologize. It seems like it was that whole thing about finding hope. Yeah. That, that's how they found hope. It's like, right. okay, now we're starting. And it was to become, they moved to like the most middle America white, right. you know, what they, they only spoke English, everything. But that was their way to, to have that bridge of future and, their, and, and a way of finding hope. So I think that, that there's a, it's not that they deny what has happened. Right. But it was like, okay, let's get started. We want to get started on our new life now. Hey, it's a great example. And, and again, who's to say that's not the right way? Mm -hmm. yeah. A little yeah. episode of confidence and flying confidence. Uh, it involves washing machine and dryers. Okay. And uh, never mind, I won't go into all of the details. Okay. But, so we end up with washing machine and dryer. And uh, you know you have a four inch round outlet for a dryer. Right. Uh, not in the new condos that the Wright brothers have put up. You have an oblong three by five. Okay. And we looked at that with these two young Iraqi men. And they saw me start to struggle. Uh, and there's a little difference in age. I'm down, on, I'm down on the floor and all of a sudden it was very clear, Jack, we'll do this. And they did. Now, you right. don't want to look at the whole construction, but they did it. They had their own little tool set. Right. I had these clumsy, larger wrenches. <laughs> and when we got done, we sat on the floor and laughed. And That's it great. was this great moment of accomplishment. That's terrific. On a, on a leaving a restaurant, and there was an exchange in Arabic. And I said, who is that? And he said, a Saudi. And I don't have to talk to him. I was just polite. And it was said with emphasis. Huh. I mean, you know, you're learning uh, a little about that. And, and again, I, I, I think it's a great story. And I, I love the, the image of you laughing with them on the floor while you're trying. They laugh a lot, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, that's great. But, but uh, they understand the nuances of relationships with people from that region yeah. in a way that I'll, you and I will never understand, you know? So we, we have, and it's not like that's the authoritative understanding. Somebody else from that region might have a different understanding. But we have to respect that they know a lot more about it than we do, um, and whatever conclusions they draw from that. Having said all this, you know, sometimes people are gonna do things that are, quote, self-destructive, you know, like, um, that get them arrested, let's say, um, or do things that put them in a vulnerable situation and they don't realize it. So I'm not saying to never try to help people look at what could be the consequences of doing something in a certain way, as long as you're being thoughtful about the things we've been talking about tonight. 
um, and you're not uh, overly imposing your values about what's right and wrong, what's safe and not safe, what's good and bad, um, what will be helpful and what's not helpful. Any final question before we call it a night? Well, certainly hearing from you about what you're already doing, um, that's great. And, and, and I think you should feel really good about that. And as I said early on, it, it's wonderful that you're doing this. And my sense from what I've been hearing is people are being very respectful. And I think that's really important and thoughtful and considerate. And I think some of the things we talked about are important to keep thinking about. And there's no quick and easy answers. But again, you need to not feel like you have to be so careful that you can't be a person. You can't be yourself. And that you can't be forming a relationship with people. Um, and you need to be able to sit on the floor and laugh with people and create those kinds of situations. Anyway, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you.